Welcome, everybody. Uh, so very, very excited to have the next speaker in our Curated Urbanisms in a Drawdown lecture series. And as you've seen from uh, our past speakers, we're including uh, sort of broad spectrum thinking about the built environment and that includes uh, uh, experts in, in disciplines outside of architecture that work directly with architecture and influence architecture uh, in meaningful ways. And so with that, I will uh, introduce Kate Kennan briefly uh, and uh, very excited, Kate, that you could be with us. Unfortunately, uh, circumstances didn't allow Kate to be in, in person, but we're we're already scheming about a, an in-person visit at, <laughs> at some point Great. to make it work. Uh, so Kate Kennan is a landscape architect and the founder and president of Offshoots Incorporated uh, based in Boston, a landscape design practice that is focused on productive planting techniques and phytotechnology consulting. For all of our students, I recommend that you try to incorporate phytotechnology into your project. <laughs> hmm. uh, use that. I like that term. Use that term on your next review. Uh, Offshoots has won numerous awards for projects integrating plantings to clean up polluted sites. Uh, having spent her childhood at her family's garden center in central Massachusetts, Kate is well versed in the plants of the Northeast. She completed her undergraduate studies in landscape architecture at Cornell University and received her master's degree in landscape architecture with distinction uh, from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Kate is also an associate teaching professor at the College of Arts, Media, and Design at Northeastern University. Her recent book, Fido, Principles and Resources for Site Remediation and Landscape Design, co-authored with Niall Kirkwood, received a National American Society of Landscape Architecture Award, Honor Award and was named one of the top 10 new landscape books by The Dirt, which is ASLA uh, platform blog in 2015. And there are many other awards and accolades, uh, but I will, in the interest of time, I will pass things off to Kate. Uh, everyone, please join me in welcoming her. Thanks, Blaine. Okay, so what I wanted to talk to you about today is show you some of the work that we're doing at Offshoots, where we use small projects as a testing ground for landscape ideas that could maybe scale up and be more transformative. And how I got started in this is I grew up, um, as Landon mentioned, on a garden center in central Massachusetts. But what I realized really early on is that the green industry wasn't so green, right? We use a lot of fertilizers and uh, water and resources and time. And my dad was shipping in all these plants from all the way across the US and Oregon and, and Washington. And they had so many miles before they would even hit the nursery. And I started thinking about landscape as there was this kind of traditional approach to landscape where we almost try to keep garden and sculpture, right? You plant a plant and then the idea is that you want it to kind of stay the same over time and that you um, basically try to control it, that maybe gets a little bit bigger, but it's basically aesthetics are the primary driver. And I drew this diagram in graduate school about the idea is as much as you import or you do garden maintenance, you're not really trying to get much more out of it besides this aesthetic, right? And what I was more interested in is this idea of productive landscape. How could you put in strategic inputs that would then you would get something out of it? So what do we, um, we started when we started offshoots about 10 years ago, or actually I think this year is our 11th year. Um, what I did is I really wanted to think about creating a new normal for productive landscapes that would influence the entire industry. So we were interested both in design, but also in horticultural installations so that we could be testing new ideas as we were starting to design them and constantly kind of reinvent the craft and then also be thinking about possibly this retail component of could we have a new garden center that would be um, kind of a, a place that people could come for new information um, and drive the industry forward. And at the center of this business model was this concept of research has to design, it has to drive the practice. And we can't really innovate without doing um, research. And so 
our practice is a little bit different than um, most others because we're not design built because we do a lot of design that we don't build. And um, we only install horticulture. So meaning we only install soils and plants. It's a living system. We don't do hardscaping or lighting or any of that. Um, and what we do is we often, we uh, will often even do a horticulture installation for other designers. So we're in a little bit of what I call this hybrid sphere of, um, of practice. And when we first started, we were small. We started with about five or six people, um, Joe, Shelby, and Mark uh, uh, in this, in this uh, image are all still with me now. And um, now we're at a practice, this is uh, quite a few years ago now already, a few years ago, but we're now at a practice of about 20 out of Boston. We're in the Charlestown neighborhood of Boston. And we're split almost evenly between half designers and half installation and what we call landscape management folks out in the field, not maintenance, but management of how do we kind of craft these ecological landscapes. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna talk about this sort of in, in three groupings. The first one is our work in phytoremediation. Um, so how I got into this, my first, very first project was actually a gas station site down on Cape Cod and the town wanted me to turn this into a park. And I didn't really know that much about gas stations, but I had learned from my under, from my graduate experience that, you know, you could have a kind of a spill of petroleum or lead and that maybe you might plant a plant such as a monoculture of switchgrass or poplar or willow to remediate that contaminant. Um, but what I started getting interested in is instead of necessarily using it as remediation, how could we outfit existing kind of polluting sources to be able to prophylactically kind of buffer that contamination? And how could we integrate it into the design process and maybe even set up those sites for a future use where some of that structure might be there? And so when I got this project, I was started getting interested in Fido and I went to this guy over here on the left, uh, Neil Kirkwood, who was, had been the chair of the uh, Harvard GSD Landscape Architecture Program and was my professor the year before. And right after I graduated, I went to Neil and I said, Neil, can we fight or remediate the site? And Neil said to me, I don't know. I was like, what do you mean you don't know? And he said, uh, Kate, basically the research is very mixed. You know, um, There's a lot of stuff on websites saying what plants can and cannot do. So let's run some research seminars at the GSD looking into the peer reviewed literature. So that's what this picture is. It's a picture of, we ran three research seminars at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, looking at the peer reviewed literature of this and went to a lot of conferences and a lot of um, phytoremediation sites. And the result of that is this book that we co-authored um, that Blaine mentioned, uh, this book, Phyto. So this, if you are interested in Phyto technologies, this is the basic place that you can come and have a reference library. I'm not trying to sell this. I literally make $1 a copy of the book. So it's not a big source of revenue. It just, if you're really interested in this work, you can search you know, by land use of what are the typical contaminants you find and what are the plants you might apply um, or by contaminant. Okay, so I'm gonna teach you some basics of uh, phytoremediation. So, Phytosynthesis, we take energy from the sun and the plant utilizes through photosynthesis. Um, it creates a lot in its process of growing, creates a lot of sugars that get leached down in the soil. And that creates this rich rhizosphere effect, right? We have a hundred to a thousand times more microbes in the soil um, underneath the plant than in regular soil alone because of these phytochemicals released by the plant and also these uh, sugars that are available to them. In addition, in photosynthesis, the plant also takes up a lot of water, right? Um, we, it, through um, evapotranspiration and transpiration, it pulls up all of this water and actually it uses some of that in photosynthesis and a lot of it actually gets transpired into the air, right? One of my favorite statistics by um, one of the scientists we met with is plants in North America move more water than all the soils, uh, than all the rivers combined in North America. Um, during the growing season because of this transpiration, this huge pull of water. So we have plants doing both of these things in the system. And so when we have particular contaminants on a site, the best thing to think about if you're a designer, if you might wanna use plants to help um, mitigate the effects of that pollutant is no, is it an organic contaminant or an inorganic contaminant? And I'm going to describe the difference. And for you know all of us designers out there, right? Organics in these diagrams are circles and inorganic contaminants are squares, okay? 
Organic contaminants tend to be compounds, things that have carbon, oxygen, nitrogen in them and can be broken down into metabolites that are no longer harmful. So this is things like petroleum or um, volatile organic compounds or chlorinated solvents or compounds um, that are often naturally extracted um, that we can get broken down. Inorganic, uh, and so this is the idea, if you added a plant into the system, the idea is it might pull in an organic contaminant and in the roots or in the leaves, it might actually break down that contaminant and it's no longer harmful. No, re no need to actually harvest the plant. The idea is the plant becomes a catalyst to break it down. This is the best opportunity for phytotechnologies, okay? Inorganic contaminants are something totally different. They are elements on the periodic table like arsenic, cadmium, and zinc, right? We know this kind of group of contaminants. You cannot break these things down into smaller parts, okay? So it, it's things like salt or nutrients or, um, or metals, right? The idea with this is that um, you might uh, put in a plant usually called a hyperaccumulator, which I'll mention what that is in a minute, and you bring in this plant and you draw the contaminant into the leaves and the root zone, but it would have to be held there, okay? And you would have to go in and then harvest the plant to remove that contaminant from the site. It's two totally different mechanisms, inorganic and organic pollutants, okay? And so what you have to use for an inorganic pollutant is you have to have a hyperaccumulator that takes up that particular contaminant at least a hundred times more than a regular plant. And then what you would do is you would plant that, you would have the, um, the plant take up that pollutant and then you would harvest it. And with the harvested material, you actually have to landfill that, you test it. And if it's above a certain level, you actually have to bring it to a hazardous landfill site, okay? The problem is that it doesn't work so good. And uh, not for, for the organic pollutants that actually break down the contaminants. We have lots of opportunities. <laughs> and excuse me, I have a bit of a cough today. So. But for the inorganic pollutants, <laughs> people have been using things like sunflower. It is a hyperaccumulator of lead to take it up. But the truth is, <laughs> it's very hard to get that pollutant into the plant. And it's because I'm really sorry about this. I'm glad I'm not in person for this reason. Um, but it is a, a problem of bio, bioavailability. What happens is these inorganic pollutants often get locked into the soil very, very heavily because of pH or organic content. And you, even though you add a hyperaccumulator in the field, we can't get that plant, that uh, contaminant into the plant because say maybe only 10% of that pollutant is actually bioavailable to the plant. So for inorganic pollutants, for the most part, <laughs> what, we're what we want to do instead is stabilize them on site <laughs> because it's very difficult to get them into the plant and then harvest them. Okay, so I made this chart, which is available on the Offshoots website, also in our book about if you have a particular contaminant on your site, is it a good opportunity for phytoremediation or less potential? And then what is the time frame for that plant to clean it up over on the bottom? Less time under 10 years or over 60 years? And here's the chart, okay? Where the good opportunities lie are in the organic contaminants such as petroleum and all the hundreds of compounds that make up petroleum, including total um, petroleum part, uh, uh, hydrocarbons, BTECs, that sort of thing. Volatile organic compounds and many chlorinated solvents, including TCE and per perchlorate, TCE is the number one contaminant of groundwater in the U.S., lots of opportunity. Petroleum is the number one contaminant of soils in the U.S., lots of opportunity. Also great opportunity for the nutrients, meaning nitrogen and phosphorus, which are key macronutrients for plants. Those are great opportunities to get them into the plant to actually remediate, as well as arsenic, nickel, and selenium, which tend, that do have hyperaccumulators and can potentially work in the field to extract them and a few pesticides. The rest of these are typically so tightly bound to soils, it's really hard to get them into a plant. Now this particular chart, to be clear, is for contaminants that we find in soil. If we have a contaminant in water, often we can use the plant and the soil as a filter to clean the water as we go through. 
And many of these contaminants can get clean through a green infrastructure system in water. But when you have it in soils, this is the kind of chart you wanna to use to think about if, if you could use a plant for this. Now, where are pollutants usually on a site? We can often have them in air, right? We can have them in uh, the rain that comes down and then washes them off our surfaces in stormwater. And then we can have them in the soils and in the groundwater. And what I'm gonna specifically talk about is the soils and the groundwater. There's also lots of opportunity in air pollution, which I'm not gonna to chew too much about today. So one of our most opportunistic areas that we can think about for plants is using phytohydraulics, this idea of tapping, um, actually cleaning up groundwater that can move contaminant plumes around. And this idea here is we can put a, a taproot plant down into the groundwater and literally move the groundwater plume. So if you had a pollutant, either organic or inorganic, in that groundwater plane, we can actually move it into the plant, <laughs> break down the organic pollutants, and then trap the inorganic pollutants. Guys, I'm so sorry about this cough. <laughs> I unfortunately, my kids decided to get real sick this week. <laughs> and I thought I had escaped it. And it seems that it turned up on Friday morning. So it is what it is. But what we typically use for these systems is a plant called hybrid poplar, or we use hybrid willow because they're phreatophytes. They're cross between, <laughs> excuse me, between the species that are shown on the screen. They, uh, hybrid poplar tends to grow four to six feet a year. So when you're looking for a catalyst that will send a lot of sugar down into the soil and move a lot of water up, <laughs> this plant will do it. <laughs> and realizing, I wish I had a loss in here someplace. I don't think I do. I might have to leave for a second to go look for one. I'm gonna see, hold on. No, all right, I'm really whatever, sorry about this plant. Whatever you need, no problem. <laughs> we've, we've all been through it. So. Uh, it's just, <laughs> I can't believe that this is happening. Of course it is. I've been on meetings all morning and I was totally fine. Oh well. So you can see over here, the difference with a phreatophyte tree is it has this long root depth that can get to 20 feet below the surface. So a hybrid poplar or a willow could do that, whereas a regular tree only has a root depth that only might only be two to three feet below the surface. Prairie grasses like switchgrass are often used for this because <laughs> they can have root depths up to about 12 feet as well. The other reason why poplar is used all the time is because its transpiration rate, right? It moves so much water, more than other species. A 30-year-old poplar can move up to 200 gallons of water a day. And a lot of the actual degradation that's happening is happening in that root zone of the plant. The plant, plant sends out phytochemicals that attracts a certain kind of um, bacteria and fungi and microbes to the soil that help break down that petroleum and use it as a food source or one of those organic contaminants. And also the plant can degrade that contaminant in the leaves with phytodegradation with these um, endophytic bacteria that live in the leaves that help break down that contaminant. So this is a really great opportunity, phytohydraulics and breaking down organic contaminants. And then we can also, the plant can volatilize those into the air and then they can actually be broken down with UV light. So now that I've given you guys the basics of phyto 101, what I wanna do is talk about some case studies that have utilized this technology that are both designed and a few um, academic projects as well. So this industry was really started back in the 90s by um, a lot of it coming out of USDA and agriculture trying to clean up Air Force bases. And some of the original ones, like this one that was done in um, the 1990s out of the Travis Air Force Base, had a contaminated groundwater plume of TCE that was coming from a battery and electric shop and going uh, towards uh, the, the campus. And it was actually, um, they did a phytoremediation project that was able to clean up that plume within five years. And that was actually done with eucalyptus rather than, uh, rather than poplar. And what we started to see now is a lot of these boutique firms that will come in and do, this is a particular firm called Intrinsic Environmental, but they come in and do phytoremediation installations across the US. 
And they're often cleaning up some sort of petroleum, or this is a, a tri TCE trichloroethylene uh, contaminated site where they're cleaning up the poplar or the, the groundwater with poplar. And where I get really excited about this is when it gets integrated into design. So Intrinsics Environmental worked with a firm called a landscape architecture firm called Atlas Labs to clean up all of these contaminants over on the left that were in um, the groundwater plume. And what they did is they had several decades of what they typically do is they go in and pump and treat to clean the groundwater. And um, it had little change on the a total uh, effects that were the, the total groundwater contamination. And so what they decided to do is when uh, a new corporation came in and bought this site, um, they decided to bring uh, Atlas Labs, the landscape architect, brought in Intrinsics Environmental to say, can we do this with Poplar? And they designed a parking lot with uh, poplar spacing six feet on center to be able to, they install these uh, six foot um, tall, uh, um, uh, what they're basically bare root poles into the ground. You can see the lower left planting is what the plants look like when they go in. They inoculated them with endophytes that they have found in the leaves to break down even more of the TCE and these other um, contaminants that they're finding. And then this is what the project looks like on the left as it starts to go in. <laughs> and then the project three, three years later on the right. And they start to put in these other underplantings of other native habitat plants as the poplars are cleaning the site. So it's a pretty exciting project that landscape architects are starting to integrate these concepts that have really been in, um, in the remediation field. And so here at Offshoots, I'm going to show you a few projects where we started small and scaled up these ideas. So one is a residential project in Cambridge, Massachusetts. On the left-hand side of this is where you see the poplar buffer. And what this is, is this is the residential uh, kind, single family residence that's in white um, here. What we knew is we do a lot of projects that we call phyto light, meaning we don't wanna test the soil or the groundwater because the truth is the, the client doesn't necessarily wanna be on the the Brownfield super highway that they have to clean it up by EPA standards, right? But we suspect there's contamination. When we went to the site, heavily smelled like petroleum and we tested the soils in this plot right here and knew uh, where the remediation planting is and knew we had high levels of lead. And we had this groundwater plume moving from an industrial area. Uh, we checked where the groundwater was moving by looking up groundwater maps. And we realized the petroleum was moving underneath the surface. Uh, within five to 15 feet <laughs> below the surface of our part, of our new park. So what we did was we installed a poplar planting that this went in bare root. Our team installed it. This is the planting after three years. That becomes a buffer for um, this <laughs> hydraulic groundwater plume to clean it up at the same time. And it, forward, it becomes the backdrop for this planting where basically how I mentioned we cannot clean up lead with plants. The hyperaccumulators don't work. What we did here is we took those lead impacted soils, we moved them into mounds on the site, stabilized them with compost, and then we put in a thick overstory layer of plants so that that lead was no longer a, a risk factor for humans to interact with. And because lead really doesn't move once you've capped it. And so we've got the poplar buffer in the back here, cleaning up the groundwater below, and the lead being encapsulated on site with these uh, with these soils. We also, this client was really, uh, really wonderful. They told us they only had $20,000 for both design and installation and that their son was gonna get married in the garden in June. So we actually decided to put in this really crazy um, purple planting uh, that was a lot of bulbs that kind of popped up through these um, mounded landforms. Uh, that the client used as a backdrop for their their um, their wedding, and the son is a sculptor, and so he also uh, this is a sculpture studio in gray in the back, and also they display sculpture in this little kind of garden that's semi private, semi public in uh, in Cambridge, and very cool because the client was also a contractor, so our former contractor, and he had all these materials on the site that we reused, these old pieces of granite, this um, steel edging that was around and we just repurposed it uh, while we did the, the phyto planting. We kind of add this phyto light concept into a lot of our projects. This is a multifamily housing project we did with UTL Architecture Practice here in Boston for seniors. 
when we got out to the site again, we realized that it smelled like petroleum almost when we were at the construction stage. And when we started looking at the aerial, there was an automobile repair shop that was really right adjacent to our site. And we knew from the groundwater where that petroleum was likely moving. And so perpendicular to that groundwater plane, we put a, a buffer of poplar only within about 18 inches of soil. We put this in as, um, as bare root plants that then grew again, four to six feet a year. This is five years after they were put in, they grow way faster than many other plants, right? They become this huge catalyst for these transactions below the ground. Um, this project and this concept that where we kind of saw a proof of concept on many of these projects is we started scaling this up. This is a half acre park that we just recently completed in, in a Charlestown, a, a neighborhood in, in um, Boston, Massachusetts. This was done with Alcus Manfredi Architects. And what this is, is it's a half acre, uh, an older industrial site. The hood milk bottling plant was here on this site <laughs> originally. And you can see the smokestack here on the upper right. But we also realized not only did we have the hood milk industrial contaminants from the soil below, but there were all these groundwater monitoring wells around the site that had high levels of both TCE and petroleum in them. We mapped the groundwater realizing it was coming from the right uh, over to the left towards the west and it was gonna bypass our site. But we also knew we were in the air pollution contamination zone from 93, the, the north uh, south corridor in Boston with this elevated highway that within 200 meters of highways, we know we have much higher levels of particulate matter that cause asthma and cardiovascular um, challenges for the populations that live in that area. And there's, a, there's some big studies in Boston at Tufts University that show this 200 meter buffer outside of these elevated highways having these much higher factors. So what we started doing is these site analyses, thinking about the polluted groundwater coming from the right, the air pollution coming from the left and realizing in the middle of that, we wanted to have a fighter remediation buffer that could both address air pollution, groundwater pollution, um, and start to protect the site from some of these winter and summer winds. So we started thinking about plants that would have these deep tap roots that would uh, intercept that contaminated groundwater plume. And also these plants for air pollution, for particulate matter air pollution specifically, that have stickier, waxier leaves shown in peer reviewed studies to capture that more than other plants when they have their leaves on them in the growing season. So we came up with all these different parties. What was amazing is um, Alcus Manfredi Architects really worked with us as a landscape designer. The, the program was to put a bike storage pavilion here. Um, and they uh, originally uh, on the left hand side and they allowed us to sink that pavilion and let the landscape move up and around it. And you can see all the different forms we were looking at, but all of them have this phytoremediation buffer on the left-hand left side. The form we ended up was with this, and the plan is really a sloped lawn panel that has an upper roof deck and a bike pavilion underneath it, and a state performance stage. And in section, we put on five feet of soil onto this, um, this bike pavilion, that we would able to get these trees very high in the air to be able to block the air particulate matter, but then on the back side of the pavilion actually be able to, um, to, to clean the groundwater with these deep rooted trees. So this is the project. You can see up in the top, this is our what we call our coastal ledge or our air pollution buffer that's up above. Um, and then you can see this at night, you can see the elevated highway that's behind. Um, and the Idea here is, is that the plants down on the lower part are the ones with the deep tap roots that are going to go down and cleanse the groundwater. And the ones on the top are these air particulate removal species. And if you guys want to see, again, particular species by contaminant, there's just lists of plant species in the phyto book that might be helpful. The other concept behind this is that we were trying to use 90% native plants with this concept that we wanted to disperse seeds into the urban environment to have things that we wanted to be there. So instead of just having invasive, spontaneous urban vegetation move into our marginalized landscapes, we wanted this to become a seed source to sp spread other seeds into the community, especially with the rail line and the elevated highway right behind our site. So we created these plant communities, really thought about visual interest and what, what different color would happen over time. All of the phytoremediation plants are underplanted 
with longer living species that will come up to ecologically make a, um, a, a different plant community over time. And they're underplanted with these meadows for pollinators that are very, very specifically targeted um, to make sure we have something blooming at all times with specific, specific color ranges. And we really carefully map what the Charlestown community was kind of doing in different times of the year. And we really made sure that the horticulture component became this kind of icono um, uh, iconographic piece that people would draw people to the area. So we have this kind of display of 30,000 bulbs that comes up in the early spring uh, to draw people there. And our horticultural installation team installed this where um, you know we were really starting to create these groves of aspen and this coastal ledge plant community that was, we had five different types of soils because these plant systems are living systems and often people don't match the soils or irrigation requirements really closely with the plant community. And we were really trying to create a plant community that would thrive over time and not lead, need a lot of maintenance. So this is us training in all our plants and coming up with our community swaths out in the field. You see, we put in the plants really, really small where we're able to kind of grow them on and we want the plant communities to morph over time. And one of the kind of architectural things that we did here is um, have very, very strong edges on, on the design, these precast concrete curves and things, so that our plant communities could be very loose and move around. Because um, we often find that people don't like these sort of messy looking landscapes, right? <laughs> so that's one of the ways that we were able to capture that. The other thing the project does is it thinks about the new um, development that might come in over time. We calculated the amount of stormwater that would be created if there were a new building um, constructed adjacent. And we captured that amount of stormwater underneath our tilted lawn and dug out the soils in that area so that they were cleaner. So we could send the water for that, have a place for the future of that stormwater of that building to go. And our streetscape in the front is a bioswale that picks up and cleans all of the water that runs off of the site. Um, here's kind of it. And in this area. The other thing too is, you know, people often are like, well, where does, where does form come from, right? Because this was an old hood milk bottling plant, we got excited by the form of the original hood milk bottle and, and used that to translate into these cur morphed curved like boomerang forms and benches that morphed from, uh, you know, a bench into a curb, into a stair. Um, and the history of the site, you know, isn't there so, um, uh, you know, doesn't hit you over the head per se, but we used it to kind of inspire, create some new forms. And this, you know, universally accessible ramp weaves through the whole landscape. This is us, one of the beauties of having an installation team is we did a lot of mock-ups, um, both in terms of form and the size. We were mocking up our monumental stair to see, could we do these big long stairs with only, you know, five foot risers? And we kept adjusting till we found the perfect dimension. We spent a lot of time on the lighting having this kind of downcast lighting that wouldn't illuminate the night sky, but really emphasize the forms as well. I mean, you can see this little um, kind of gem of a pavilion that Elkis designed that really um, kind of emerges out of the landscape form below. And then, uh, really anchoring on that good milk tower. So we're really starting to see excitement around this project. It's been built, uh, it's been installed about a year and a half and now Offshoots is continuing doing that horticultural maintenance as we go forward. All right, so um, moving into the, talking a little bit, uh, now transitioning from phytoremediation, really to talk about uh, water cleansing. We do a lot of work in water cleansing, especially along the Charles River in Boston that we, has a very big watershed. This is the Charles River up on the top of this um, with its watershed dashed around it. And the problem with the Charles River is it had you know, deep water quality in 1995. And then we separated our storm sewer and our sewers, our, our storm drains and our sewers. And it got up to an A minus in 2013, but then went back down to a B plus because we have too much phosphorus in our rivers. And what's happening is many of the roadways that um, are around the Charles have flushes of nitrogen and phosphorus that get into the river. Then we have the algae grow, right? And it's eutrophication that we then have no long, don't have oxygen in the river and we have these big blooms that are also um, that we have this bacteria that's toxic and become, makes the river unswimmable as well. And so we were brought on by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation for the Longfellow Bridge Project, a historic project in Boston. 
and they just wanted us to clean up the stormwater. They gave us this little peanut of a site to clean up the stormwater that was coming up the, off the Longfellow Bridge. So we designed a gravel stormwater wetland that actually sends the water underground. The water never comes to the surface through the plant roots to remove the phosphorus from the planting. This is the project here. We're going to fly in over Massachusetts into the um, over the Charles River and into our peanut of our site. And the idea is the water comes in through a sedimentation forebay where we try to remove the sediment that's in the water. 50% of phosphorus is typically in solid sediment in the water. And if you could just let that settle out and get the sediment out, we've gotten rid of a lot of the pollution. Then it moves into two gravel set wetland cells and then out to be able to clean up that storm water, sorry. And we did this through a design of plants that were 100% native to the um, to our uh, Suffolk County area. I also designed the plants to not be any higher than 30 inches in height, so it wouldn't look messy. And also with this kind of very limited color palette and um, spiky texture, because we knew that DOT wasn't going to maintain it. We have two of these installations, the peanut on one side, and this is the other one on the Boston side, which has been more successful just because we use less plant species. And I think it doesn't look as weedy as the other one, where I think the form is beautiful. I think a lot of people think it looks too weedy. Um, but here you can see the sedimentation forebay where the muck is basically taken out of the water. And you have to clean this out, and then it goes through these systems of plants. What's really nice about this um, community is we've really seen a huge uptick in the pollinators that we have out there. Um, and this is me out on the, the peanut side, on the Cambridge side. You, know, you can see how the plant community on the top, this is actually mostly native species. I was out here tagging invasive species for herbiciding and taking out, but it looks kind of, you know, it, it looks kind of loose, right, in terms of the aesthetic. But what we do at the end of every single year is we cut down the plant material to nothing and remove that biomass from the site because if we let those plants just decompose down into the soil, it will release the phosphorus. Remember how I mentioned that phosphorus is an inorganic contaminant? You have to harvest the plant to move it. In this particular case, what we're doing is at the end of every season, we cut all the plant material down, harvest it from the site to remove the phosphorus before the next growing season. We've been doing the same thing at a lot of small uh, Boston public schools. We did um, five different installations of green infrastructure showing how to remove phosphorus from the um, from the watershed, we tried all different sorts of insertions of rain gardens and we harvested water in cisterns. Uh, we looked at bioswales, we created these long-term maintenance plans for how um, the city would take care of them. Well, they have a lot of big education component. One of the installations is actually a field that's actually a turf field that just lets water come down through it and through a sand filter bed to clean up the phosphorus. Um, you know, the challenges with all these city projects, best laid plans are um, never met. What happened is all the projects got installed, city ran out of funding, didn't maintain them. It's been four or five years now. What we did is having an installation practice, we were able to come back out and save them. So we basically have been in a partnership with a nonprofit called Excel that they teach um, youth like a, almost a vocational training that um, to learn how to get new horticultural skills. And we partnered with this nonprofit to come out to give them horticultural skills while also trying to clean up these installations. So similarly, we really try to link in with the community as much as we can to teach them about <laughs> these important kind of landscape processes. And this is a project called Blessing of the Bay. It's a half acre long park that we've been working on the schematic design on for many years, but it's been stuck because there hasn't been any, fu in any funding. This is along the Mystic River in Somerville. And we really mapped kind of uh, the species and the plants that work together um, to support uh, the ecology along the Mystic River and created these different habitat schemes of how we could raise the topography to prevent flooding and create different um, niche zones for habitat to move into. We also really carefully mapped the, the tree species that were out there. And, and the project got stalled because of this kind of lack of funding, even the community and an ownership problem, because part of the land is owned by a regional entity. And since it was stalled, what we've been doing is doing all these small interactive projects with the community to help kind of push it on its way. So one of them is we mapped all the tree species on site and realized 
that the tree species that had been planted originally in the park is what all the little babies were, of course, on the shoreline. And that we wanted to show, make this uh, system visible to the public. So we decided to harvest all this non-native invasive bittersweet that was along the site. Uh, we harvested uh, it with a group of volunteers. And then we wove that into rings and we painted them with this non-toxic milk paint, paint with a group of students from the local school. And the paint represented the different species that were the tree species that were out on the site. And then we created this visual display and then hung it out at the local boathouse to teach people about the different tree species that were out there, as well as engaging the kids. Um, so we had a lot of fun with this. And so when you're not able to do your big project, right, this idea of these small little interventions that you could do to get into a community, we get really excited about. Now we're doing the same sort of thing is, is that we're converting some of the bluegrass lawn out on the site to meadows, and we're using them as a test case to try different meadow species and try to get these ecological meadows that are there. So this is us. We basically came in and got a permit to take out little portions of bluegrass lawn that we were able to fund with these small grants. We then have been installing this meadow, but they take a very long time to be able to kill the weed seed. So while that was happening, we started creating the signage program to bring awareness of what the meadow would do for the community. But then we work with the local kids um, at the same school, the Healy School down the street to paint wings for fireflies that we, the fireflies are now moving into the space and starting to pollinate it before the rest of the, the meadow moves in. So this has been a kind of a way to use public art and engage the community about a process that's gonna take quite a bit of time. And this is, this is sort of what's just starting to sprout uh, that we're seeing out there now. We're really excited because we're partnered with the Tufts Pollinator uh, Initiative that they're going to actually help us map the pollinators that are moving into the space and see which species of plants are actually bringing in the most native pollinators, not necessarily the European honeybees and the bumblebees that we all, all see and notice, more the solitary bees. All right, and then lastly, kind of the group of projects I want to talk about is this group of myco remediation. So Myco is this idea of utilizing fungi and their associated um, uh, and their associated systems underneath the ground to be able to cleanse stormwater. So we've been partnered on a project with Massachusetts Department of Transportation to think about how fungi could actually improve the cleansing of our stormwater green infrastructure systems. We did this uh, about year and a half long project that um, we are just wrapping up right now. The report's going to be available in about a month. It's being reviewed by Federal Highway. But basically, you know, we have all these contaminants that we get from these roadway landscapes. And um, MassDOT got sued <laughs> to be able to actually clean these up. And they've been doing green infrastructure installations. But how could they add maybe additions of fungi to improve nitrogen and phosphorus uptake? So. What we did at Offshoots is we, in, uh, we did a big research project with them. We looked at peer reviewed literature. We did expert interviews with many mycologists and expert areas in this field. We then looked at the field studies and lab studies, both the peer, one, peer reviewed ones and the anecdotal ones to see where the work was being done. And we realized that the saprophytic fungi, meaning the, and I'm not really gonna talk about, the mushroom is just the fruiting body on the fungi, right? Many of these fungi systems actually don't even have a fruiting body or a mushroom, these mycorrhizal fungi that are the plant partners that connect plants below the ground. And the saprophytic fungi are the ones on the left that do have fruiting bodies and decompose um, wood structures. So those are the two main categories of <laughs> fungi that we found that have opportunity here. But what we realized really quickly is that this is not ready to roll out at all. There's actually a dearth of peer reviewed studies out there. We see these experts like, you know, Paul Stamets and Trad Cotter getting so excited about these fungi systems, but there are many studies that are anecdotal in nature and not peer reviewed. They may not have controls. There's uh, very short durations. There's um, an infrequent sampling. Most of the projects are on the West Coast and here in Massachusetts, we have a very different uh, climate than they do on the West Coast. But we started getting excited about, we do see potential, but the literature review is not there yet to support it. So we identified six different kinds of places that DOT could add fungi potentially to the system. 
And now we're investigating through pilot projects, three of those to start to look at, to create our own peer reviewed literature to see if some of the, these trends that we're seeing might actually work out in a long-term environment. So we're really excited about this work going forward. Um, and if you wanna know more on the specifics of it, again, the report is coming out in about a month. Um, so to kind of wrap up, it's when you start to do, you know, these landscape projects, you do these research in different areas and they start to kind of come together, right? And one of these projects where the work has come together is we've been working on a biotech campus on the North Shore of Boston. Um, that's a B corporation and um, is an amazing corporation because they do the, all the, their lab work in this facility and even have um, a living machine that processes all their wastewater on site. And they, they're so careful about water quality, but their whole entire campus is just completely surrounded by bluegrass lawn. And so they hired offshoots to come in to create an ecological plant strategy to kind of take over that bluegrass lawn. And so we have a series of woodlands and shrub thickets and meadows to kind of encompass that. We've carefully cra crafted this new meadow to, um, that would wrap the, the building. And this is us, it's just, uh, this has been a project in design for a couple of years and we just started installing some of the woodland remnants this past year. These are the slopes kind of around the campus that we're, we basically went into the forest ecology right adjacent and we started um, inventorying all the species that were there, looked at the natives and the plant community that was there and started bringing that into the site. And we really started treating this more as a landscape restoration strategy with these small plants. And from learning all we did in the in the micro um, in the micro research, we realized that we needed to inoculate these dead construction soils with fungi and the other um, soil food web that is existing around. Everyone gets all excited about inoculating with compost, but compost is essentially dead because it's been heated to 300 degrees and doesn't have a lot of the microbial community that's actually we need in our soils. So what we learned in our micro research project is harvest reference soils from a local um, community, brew them, we are brewing them with a vortex brewer and actually watering it and using reference soils onto our site to inoculate these new plant communities. So we're really excited about this project. We're in the middle of kind of planting it. And I, you know, in the next couple of years, we'll really be showing how this kind of landscape is, has really taken off as an alternative. So to wrap up, you know, the, this pro the, these kinds of works could not be done without this kind of amazing team that we here at, have here at Offshoots. You know, we have this kind of combination of horticulturists and plant people that are working out in the field and landscape architects um, that we kind of all work together. And it's really fun kind of getting, getting your hands dirty and working, working out there. But I really find that landscape changes over time, right? It's so different than architecture because we don't just design something that is going, you know, architecture can morph and change too, but it's it's more static than landscape, right? We want things to evolve. And what we realize as our role as designers is not just in the design, but in the long-term kind of management of shifting these different systems the way that we want them to go. And we can really use these small scale projects to create these more productive landscapes. So with that, I think I will end and I'm happy to take questions. This is my contact information for anyone who wants to get in touch. We have a lot of information on our website at Offshoots if, and also on our Instagram page. Um, we put on a lot of case studies of different phytoremediation projects that are happening around the country and even around the world of what is going on um, and happy to help anyone with uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Kate. That's super inspiring. Uh... And and what a great lesson. I mean, most of us, well, just speaking for myself, don't uh, have the chance to delve this deeply into uh, looking at living systems and adaptations the way that you're very, very clearly and succinctly showing uh, with many new terms like rhizodegradation and photo volatilization. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and, and I love the so much the fact that the work that you do has a direct and obvious kind of measurable, tangible impact, right? A visual yeah. impact. Uh, 
And before I, I, I'm ready to launch into discussion, but before I jump in, I just wanted to say like a little housekeeping thing. Uh, Bridget, while you're on, if you don't mind um, forwarding Jonathan the link from Zoom so that he he's had trouble getting on. <laughs> so he was going to be in the space with us to join. He had the same problems I, I had earlier um, trying to log on. That would be helpful if you don't mind doing that. Sure. But we, uh, for folks that are here, uh, it, you know, in the webinar space uh, more broadly, please feel free to um, to add your questions uh, in the chat or the Q and A. And I'll just start if 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 I might. Uh, I'll start with I've got some. Uh, and a quick question is where? So when you harvest plant material that has that's taken up pollutants like phosphorus. Where does that harvested plant material go? That's a great question. So when it's phosphorus and nitrogen, right? Those are, are actually nutrients that build soil. So what's so great in those systems is literally you just compost it and it recycles back into um, soils that can go on another project that need high nutrient soil. So you can literally, one of the um, things that with pollution, a common term is solution to pollution is dilution, right? Mm -hmm. If you harvest a plant material and say it even has, say if it, it was a hyperaccumulator of arsenic, which it is one of the hyperaccumulators we can do, mm -hmm. we could actually add small amounts of that arsenic to compost piles and it won't break down, but it'll become, because of the rest of the volume of the soil, it becomes a background level and is no longer harmful as a significant amount. So one part is just composting and diluting it. The other way that it happens is that if you have so much arsenic and it's so high of a level that you're not going to dilute it, we actually do test that plant material and it goes to a hazardous waste landfill and it truly just gets landfilled. Just like if you were going to dig and haul, you know, typically the way that we would find an arsenic contaminated site is we would remove all that soil dig it and move it to a hazardous waste landfill. But in this case, at least it's such a smaller amount of material because you're only, a lot of times you would even burn that and you would only have an ash left behind. And then you could just have, just um, basically landfill that small amount of ash. So um, there's lots of different ways that way, but the beauty of it, like I mentioned with these organic pollutants like petroleum and trichloroethylene, is they're actually broken down, right? So there's no need to harvest the plant, which is, that's why, that's really where Offshoots has started doing a lot of our work because you when you harvest the plants for the, for the phosphorus and nitrogen for water quality, it's important you don't have a byproduct that's a problem. But for these other places, if we can just insert and help ramp up the, the what's going on in the soil, it really helps ramp up that microbiology. That, that's fascinating. And um, speaking of the inorganic pollutants, I've been reading recently about phyto mining. Uh, yeah. As as particular elements become more and more valuable, how realistic is that to use plants to actually pull the elements out of the plants? Yeah. So there is um, there phyto mining started with nickel, um, and nickel is very interesting because it's very expensive to mine. And then, I don't know if you remember my chart, but arsenic, selenium, and nickel are three of the ones that actually can get pulled out that don't have a bioavailability issue a lot of the time. So uh, there was a scientist way back in the early 1990s that developed a patent to mine nickel with a particular hyperaccumulator. And what happened is a nickel mining company bought the patent because they didn't want to roll it out because they were so afraid that it was gonna make such an impact on the industry. The patent actually just recently expired a few years ago. And I'm starting to see all this literature on phyto mining nickel again in a different kind of way. So that is absolutely a possibility. Again, do, are people looking into silver and gold? Yes. <laughs> is that applicable? No, the only element that we've seen it actually possible for right now is nickel. But wow. is that a possibility? And are scientists looking at it? Absolutely. And what they do is they plant the plant. Basically, it pulls it out of the ground. You right. cut the plant, and then you would do the same thing as you burn it down. So you have a very amount of ash 
that that makes that nickel very concentrated and then they literally they literally will put that into uh you know melt it and and smelt it to use it wow that's fascinating and there's a whole carbon question there too right because they're releasing the carbon or carbon dioxide <laughs> you are you're releasing the carbon yeah. is that less detrimental than my, a mining operation and what's going on you know remember you're releasing the carbon from the plant and depending on how much biomass that plant put on it may not be that significant because it might be a smaller herbaceous plant like this um alyssa morale that that just concentrates it so heavily in the leaves and it's a kind of a small plant so you're actually not burning off that much but yeah. there is this whole new that's one of the reasons this patent is coming back is there's a scientist working on extracting the nickel out of the plant not by burning so, that's fascinating yeah uh, i okay we have we have a question uh, so david peterson asks to your knowledge has anyone looked into plants interacting with nuclear radiation like how the plants around chernobyl and hiroshima have recovered and are restoring the land That's yeah it. absolutely so there were many projects it's one of the reasons i brought up the sunflower right there were many projects that <laughs> saw saw the sunflowers and a few other plants as hyperaccumulators of um, uranium, cesium, and some of these other things. And there were quite a few test sites planted out around Chernobyl hmm. <laughs> afterwards. But the problem was, is again, it was this question of bioavailability. If you put that plant in a greenhouse condition hmm. and you controlled for pH and all of these other things, the plant would take it up. But when they planted out, planted it out into field studies, it actually didn't work. They did they the the half life and breakdown of the radio, uh, the radionuclides, which actually faster than the uptake into the plant. So it has not shown to be an effective means right now. If you go and this is the thing, guys, the difference between peer reviewed literature and website literature is very different, right? Yeah, right. You can go online and find your noble planting and all of these other oh, we're planting especially sunflower or poplar or willow just because it grows so fast and it gets confused with other types of phyto. Hmm. But you can find these, but, but the truth is, is that most of the peer-reviewed literature shows that it's not an effective means as far as we understand right now. You, hmm. you have to add acid and other things to the soil to release it. And then you end up dripping it down into the groundwater supply and it's actually more dangerous. Uh, so you know, the inorganic side of this is just, it's not, a, it's not the best place for phyto. Okay. Um, except for, except for arsenic, selenium, <laughs> you keep saying this, the qualifying arsenic, that's why we have that, that, uh, that kind of chart, because nitrogen, phosphorus, yes, and arsenic, selenium, and nickel, there are, there are some good opportunities. Great. Uh, on a related note, I mean, I, I, I chuckled a little bit, well, the fact that oftentimes uh, clients or um, yeah users uh, owners will give you very small amount of space in which to do a lot right the expectations are high the resources or at least the physical space resources are very low and just thinking about your original diagram when you were in school about kind of like doing the most with the least to have the biggest impact. Uh, and I'm curious, Kate, about how you measure that impact. Uh, there's certainly the visual measure. I mean, the the projects are are beautiful, right? And you can see the these beautiful species growing. But I'm just curious about um, like how how do you actually test? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a great it's a great question. Um, so, like I mentioned, for if we're thinking about um, habitat improvement. Right, we often pop, um, try to partner with a postdoc or someone at a school to help us measure these things because a lot of the times they're looking for research projects or we can offer a small stipend to do that. So, for example, that Tufts Pollinator Initiative yeah. is one that it's a postdoc student that has a big range of research studies in the Somerville area, and they're going to help us do these bio blitzes to measure what plants are attracting things. Right, so we try to do that. When it comes to our contaminated sites, like I say, I call our projects Phyto Light a lot because I really think that, I really believe that they're working, but I don't know because the truth <laughs> is, is the clients don't want to test those sites. Oh, okay. 
So when we do get a client that can test a site, we get really excited, but people don't want to find contamination a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that, that is a tricky part of it. Um, when it comes to water quality cleansing, we do do a lot of like input and output testing, the same sort of ideas that, you know, you can run a study. Um, so for example, with mass department of transportation, you know, can we consider running studies to look at the, the inflow coming in on the pipe and then the outflow of the phosphorus? We've been talking to them for a lot, um, quite a bit of time. Cause again, the challenge is, is people don't want to know if it's not working. <laughs> so there can be a challenge there, but we have, we have done some inflow and outflow testing on projects, but it's always with an academic partner. And so one of the great things in being at Northeastern now, I was at the GSD before when we were doing the research seminars and now being at Northeastern is, you know, having these partnerships with scientists and other people that might be interested in actually looking at the work when it fits in with their academic work already. So it's, yeah. it, I think finding in the academic partners and being able to offer some funding as part of that and building that into your project as monitoring is important. That's great. Um, I was just thinking about the kind of broader aspirations of the work. I mean, there's clearly so much need, right? The world is sadly very contaminated with all kinds of things, uh, air, soil, and water, uh, and and needs this work. <laughs> it's it's yeah. so significant. And I was, but I was thinking like at scale. So imagine sort of dreaming big, right? At scale, what would it look like? I'm I'm thinking about how, for example. There's been discussion about how we're redesigning landscapes. We, who's we, a human society, are sort of redesigning landscapes intentionally or unintentionally around products and buildings and the things that we're doing. It's thinking about uh, managed forests, right? So called managed. I love that word, but mm -hmm. uh, right, uh, you know, that we're actually changing what those landscapes are based on the products that we want from them, like buildings and food and things. But um, but imagine, let's all imagine if we're changing the landscapes uh, in a similar way, but specifically about remediation, right? Like, what if it is you know what is a, a sort of global phyto project look like, and then how might that change ecosystems broadly? Yeah, it's a great question. I really um, so the thing about phyto is it takes time, right? And part of the problem with when I first started doing this research, I thought that I was going to have so many Fido projects and people are going to come in and do this. But the problem is because it takes time, most of the sites, by the time it's come to the landscape architect, they want to flip it and turn it into a piece of development or a project. So you don't have time for the plant to act, right? right. So if these things are going to be scaled up, it has to be what I would call a holding strategy, right? It happens mm -hmm. while the ground is marginalized or things are fallow and we're not ready for it to be pretty. So I get real excited, you know, early on when Chris Reed was doing the work in Detroit, we talked about this idea of how do phytotechnologies start to come in early on in a phased approach and then start to get harvested and move, moved on. And the other thing too, is these plants tend, because they grow so fast, they tend to be pioneer species. They're the species that would pioneer a site first, grow really fast, and then their life cycle is gone afterwards. And you have to have these other longer lived species behind them if you want it to turn into something else later. So every plant community, I mean, the beauty of landscape is it's very regional, right? And if we start taking the poplar idea, like there are native poplars to different regions all over the place. And if you use your native poplar and your native willows that are to your environment or whatever your deep root phreatophytes like the eucalyptus is out west you think about your plant community and how you could start to start to do, be this bridge in these marginalized landscapes that could start to pull contaminants and then might have a different ecosystem show up over time after those plants either you know reach their mature life or get harvested or whatever it is so uh, to me, it, it does, when we think about global stuff, right, I just think this opportunity for marginalized landscapes, like, what could we be doing in these sites as they sit vacant and fallow, or the, the slices in between the roadways, or the, you know, the, these sort of, um, I just keep saying the word marginalized lands, but I think that's a good, that's a good way to think about it, but it can be done so cheaply, you know, Fido, when it works, is 10% of the cost 
of digging and hauling, 10% of the cost of if you are, if you're doing groundwater pump and treat and removal. So they can be so cost effective when they're useful. It's just that so many people think, oh, I'm going to remove the lead. I'm going to remove the, you know, I'm going to remove the um, cadmium or the zinc or the chromium. And they, they just don't work in those circumstances. So you just have to kind of know when to know that there's a good opportunity there. And then, you know, I, I just see it as a fit. I think it's more important for planners to honestly, um, people that are thinking big global or urban designer, thinking big world global timescale things, um, even more so than as we hit it as a site designer. That's, that is really, uh, really important information. I'm glad that you're sharing all of this. I was just thinking, uh, originally, we were talking about how uh, we would love to have a landscape architecture program here at UNC Charlotte. We don't, uh, and and to have have that um, significant knowledge about site, about uh, plantings, about landscape design, etc., uh, kind of infuse the culture of what we do here. And so this is all the more valuable for that. But I'm wondering if you. If you have thoughts for our students that you would share, like what what would your guidance be to our students about how to learn more uh, in addition to reading your book? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't picture anyone to read the book. I think it's more going to be like a reference. I mean, look up the index. I'm working on a gas station site. What should I do? Yeah. Um, but I think the thing is, you know, as we all know, it's like you got to bring in that you're never going to learn all this information on your own. Right. And so forming the right interdisciplinary teams and having the right people on the table, like bring in the, the phytotechnology expert or bring in the landscape architect that has those ideas. So that's the first one. But then, you know, just to be able to get interested in what these systems are and how we can impact the kind of the, the landscape. You know, I think that the best way to get engaged, it's the same thing. It's I find conferences and he's left these sorts of formats as a really easy way to watch recorded content yeah. on a specific topic. And it, there's these incredible landscape organizations that are more out of horticulture rather than out of landscape architecture mm. that I think have the the nitty gritty and nuances of how plants grow that I think could be inspiring from the other direction. So ecological, the ones that I know because they're Northeast based, Ecological Landscape Alliance, New Directions in American Landscape. Hmm. Um, there's this whole master class that's run out of the UK by Noel Kingsbury, who's an author of 30 different landscape books. He does partnerships with Piet Udolf and all these you know, really preeminent plantsmen and horticulturists that designers work with. I love the information coming out of that realm. I mean, it's also great having the landscape architects involved as well with the design filter, but I love the pure science that comes out of the plant, um, kind of the, the, the plant sciences arena. Well, yeah, and I love how you merge arts and sciences. I mean, it's very much a STEM discipline as much as right. it is. Uh, the kind of design discipline. I mean, they're they're blended together so well. I just want to put out another call for if we have any questions. I think you might have to use the Q and A feature if you're trying to use the chat. Um, <laughs> welcome more questions. Um, and um, yeah, and I would just say that what what inspires me. I we had some design reviews recently. Our second year students were showing designs, and a lot of them are so focused on the buildings as objects that. I kind of can uh, in their second year students, and and this is kind of typical in architecture. But a lot of the commentary, some commentary was, well, what about the site? What about the site? Uh, and I I hope that for all the students here uh, watching, that you can see that this this kind of work is uh, is so important in terms of its performance, right? It's not. It's you know it yes. Landscapes should be beautiful and, and they do so many things for us um, in terms of the aesthetics, but also the how they can actually perform and do much more than buildings can do in this case. Okay, we have another question. This is from Greer Friedrich uh, asks, uh, so it says, UNC Charlotte's Botanical Gardens and their staff could be a great resource for students interested in learning more about horticulture on campus. Thank you, Greer. <laughs> For the yeah. plug, not a question or something to vocalize, but a tidbit for someone at some point. So I vocalized your good, your good points yeah. and message to good everybody. Point. And uh, and Kate, when you when you visit, 
campus. I'd love uh, to. When we arrange that, we'll definitely take you by there as well. So that sounds great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity, Blaine. It's so great to get, uh, you know, have an introduction of the school. And, you know, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to email. Okay. And uh, I I hope that your kids get better. I hope yeah. that you stay well. And that I don't call <laughs> it. resolved itself after a while, but well, that was yeah. intense. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. I, I, I appreciate you, you know, all the devoting this time and energy to, to us. It's a huge benefit to us. I really appreciate uh, having this time with you and, and sharing your work. It's really inspired me and I think everyone else. So Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. Best of luck and hope everyone has a great weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Thank you Thanks so much. Great. Okay. Bye-bye.